on the Texas A&M Sports Network from Learfield. To center, left center field, it's Falls. Two runs, single by Werner, and the Aggies have their first lead, 4-2. to two. Pitch, fly ball into left center field, drifting back at the wall. Gone! Catch. Jordan run. Thompson hits a two-run home run, and we are tied at four. This is Texas A&M Baseball, brought to you by Bud Light. It's for the fans. And by The Pool Guy, a proud corporate partner of Texas A&M Athletics. Now, here is the voice of Texas A&M Baseball, Andrew Monaco. Play, play ball! Howdy, Ags. Welcome to the second episode of the Jim Sloshnagel and Aggie Baseball Radio Hour from Rudy's Barbecue. I am not Andrew Monaco. Andrew Monaco is on the, uh, what, I, what I call it, coach the wine and cheese tour of Des Moines, Iowa right now. So, Tyler Pig alongside the head coach of the Aggies, Jim Sloshnagel. Welcome into the broadcast, coach. and glad to have you for another uh, Aggie Baseball Radio Hour. It's been a uh, busy month since the last time we chatted. Yeah, it really has. Uh, and glad to have you here, Tyler. You've been doing an awesome job. Uh, and we'll see how the next four or five weeks go as to whether we bring Andrew back. Yeah, we'll see. I'm like in like the fourth inning of the start. You know, we got a yeah. couple more, a couple yeah. more outs. Yeah, get. most people don't know who Wally Pip is, but yep. we'll see. Uh, we see if you if you can Wally Pip him. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we've uh, you know the first uh, four weeks or so of the season have they've been interesting. Um, the challenge, you know, you always start the season hoping everything is going to go perfectly as planned, and it never does. And you know, there's going to be great days and there's going to be challenges and We've had our share of both, and uh, now it's time to to start conference play and uh, and see you know what direction we take take from there. You know we'll talk about conference play coming up. You guys are 13 and four overall, have won eight in a row, 10 out of your last 11. You've put in the win column, but let's start back opening weekend and kind of work our way through as we start. The two things that have been constant about this ball club so far, at least what I've noticed in the first 17 games, is something you probably wouldn't have said a year ago about this group: starting pitching, defense. And that's something you guys have really hung your hat on over the first 17 games, and you've seen it really come to fruition and I've dropped to a really good start in those two categories for sure. Yeah, well, we it's had to be since, you know, offensively, we've whether it be because of just more not there yet or injury, mm -hmm. um, we haven't, you know, performed offensively the way I think everybody expected us to, I expected us to, our team expected us to, uh, the way we're capable of. Um, and but But at the same time, I also said before the season that, you know what the way we won baseball games last year that's that's not sustainable over time you know pitching and defense and limiting free bases and you know having a good bullpen and solid starting pitching is is the way we want this program to be you know not be built it's it, this has been a great program but the way we want to continue to build on it and um you know detmer's been solid uh had the one bad outing against louisville uh troy wansing continues to improve uh, Cortez wasn't as good this past Sunday, but he's infinitely better overall right now than he was this time last year. And I think Justin Lampkin and, you know, uh, Tucker's been okay, but Justin Lampkin yeah. is a is a future star in this program. So I like where we are, you know, that way uh, compared to this time last yeah. year. Um, and we have more options out of the bullpen. Uh, and so, and those guys, especially last night against Rice, uh, I, I think we're growing up there. We're, we're getting better. Uh, but, you know, we have to continue to improve. And, and the goal is to be is to continue to get better over the course of the season. You know, you don't want to I mean, it's awesome to play your best baseball early and you want to play it all year long. Uh, but as we saw, you know, with whether it be Ole Miss playing great at the end or whether it be Tennessee having their worst weekend at the worst possible time yeah. in the Super Regional, um, you just want to keep getting better and, and, and win ball games along the way. Talked about that a lot last year and even this year uh, after the, the Portland series where you took the Sunday game and really that's kind of been the, the launch pad for this group is just kind of building on each weekend. Um, you go to Houston, you take two out of three down there, the Shriners Children's College Class. I think last weekend a sweep over Northern Kentucky, but there's been kind of a different uh, piece that's been added to this group last weekend. Offensively, it seemed that things have been really clicking for this team over the last eight games, scored 10 runs, I believe six different times. The bats have started to pick up and you said the guys have really bought into what you guys are trying to do offensively. What does that kind of mean for your group, especially with Michael early leading the way uh, offensively from the hitting approach? You guys have really bought into what the system is that you guys have and your players are starting to do that so far midway through the, or really at the end of non-conference plays, you hit SEC play. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the you know the the system you know or the you know I think you know baseball is still baseball, but yep. but for us the system is you get a good pitch to hit, whether that be the first pitch of the at bat or the sixth or seventh or eighth pitch of the at bat, right? And it's not it's not to panic. Uh, the goal of the at bat is not to strike out. It's 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 not to walk either. It's to put together a good at bat. And what is the game asking me to do right now? Yep. The game's asking me. Oh, there's a runner at third base and less than two outs. The game is asking me to put the ball in play and score that run. Um, and so uh, you know, and, and the game and the good hitters also use the entire field to hit. So, for example, a lot of the hits you saw us have on. Uh, Sunday with the wind blowing in against what uh, against Northern Kentucky you saw those left-hand hitters like Jack Moss and Casey Wells and and Targot using the back side of the field to hit right good hitters don't b bad hitters roll over balls right so if you most good hitters over the course of time a, a right-handed hitter if you see him hitting a lot of ground balls on the left side of the infield that's probably not a good sign for most good hitters right you think about Tony Gwynn and you think about Wade Boggs and you think about some of the best hitters in the major leagues the reason they have hit for a high average is they use the whole field they can hit it to left field they can hit it to right field and so you know when we're when we are at our best we're we're using the whole field to hit and like last night yep, exactly. uh, Austin Boast who is a he constantly has to fight he wants to pull the ball all the time but he hit a ball you know 105 miles an hour into the right center gap Hunter Haas is leading our team in hitting. Why? Because he uses the whole field to hit. Jack Moss had 100 hits last year. I love him to death, but he's not running out of the site in a day. <laughs> right? So he's not going to leg out any hits, but he had so many hits because he used the whole field. So I think we've seen more of that. So we're, we're getting on base, right? Our on-base percentage is high. We take our walks, uh, and then we get those timely hits, yep. and we're using the whole field to hit. So... You know, is the is the pitching going to step up this weekend? No question. Is it going to step up in the SEC? No question. But I think our guys are prepared for that. They're excited about it, and uh, we'll find out. I was going to ask you about the walks. You know, a, a comment you always say is good hitters know the strike zone better than the umpires do. And their guy back there, Jack Moss, who we're going to talk right. later, he probably knows the strike zone better than anybody. But this team, until last night, has basically led the SEC in walks the entire year, top five in the country. Is that a sign of a really mature team at the plate as you go into an SEC play where you feel really good about their approach, about their plate discipline going in? Because when you mentioned the pitching will amp up, but you know what this team's going to be able to do at the plate and know their approach and how they want to be able to attack a pitcher. Yeah, I mean, again, the goal is not to get walks, and the goal is not to drive up. Everybody thinks you're trying to drive up the pitch count of the pitch. It has nothing to do with it. That's mm -hmm. a byproduct of the Ted Williams, the sci one of the best books of hitting ever, the science of hitting, Ted Williams, page one, sentence one, paragraph one, is get a good pitch to hit. You can have the most beautiful swing in the world. If you swing at the ball, it bounces. You're not going to hit it, yep. right? So that, that's what it's about, and that's going to lead to – if you do that and you're patient and you swing at strikes and you take balls, that's going to lead to two things. It's going to lead to walk, some walks. It's also actually going to lead to some strikeouts because you're going to be in deep counts. Yep. So you can't panic about that. Um, but uh, eventually, if you – the goal is to – put a good swing on a good on your pitch and then if you're big and strong like we want to be then not only do you get hits but you get extra base hits and that's what we had had have happened last year last year's team was the consummate offense we swung the bat the least in all of the sec yep. we had the lowest swing percentage but when we did swing we had the highest slugging percentage yep. so imagine if you're a pitcher and you, man, you throw it just a little bit off, and ah, dang it, they won't swing at it. You throw a little bit in, ah, they won't swing at it. Then you finally throw it over the plate, and it's a double, yep. or it's a triple, or it's a homer, or it's a hard hit ball. That's a tough team to pitch to, right? So that that's the team you that in a perfect world that we want to be. Now, this weekend, for example, Friday night against Paul Skeens, he's a strike thrower. Yep. He's a good strike thrower at 98 to 101 miles an hour. There's going to be a lot of pitches to hit. But they're going to be really tough to hit, especially on a cold night. So, you know, a, a good pitching, you know, beats you know a great offense most days. 
Uh, so we're going to have to be on, ready to go and ready to swing and ready to, to, to be on the fastball. Uh, but, but that is the kind of offense, we, you know, that we, ideally we, we try to be. Before we get a break, I want to ask you about a couple of your freshmen really fast. And one of those is the guy, Justin Lankin. He got the ball last night. Like you talked about it. He has kind of fell into the spot as the middle, the midweek guy for you guys in the rotation. But we've seen Kate and Ken step up, Jay Slaviolette step up, uh, Case of Wells step up, Shane Sedeo. We could go on and on and on. But how proud are you this freshman group? Because you've used this non-conference play portion of your schedule the first 17 games to put them in the line of fire and a lot of them had a ton of success early on uh, throughout the first 17 games of the year yeah well you know it wasn't as much to just roll them out there it's just you know with the injuries to Werner the injuries to yeah. Minnick um, Jace obviously Caden Ken specifically uh, and even Cason Wells and Max Coffer uh, yep. all those guys earned the right to play whether they're whether that be because they outplayed somebody that was older than them or because of the injuries so um, so, yeah, I'm, you know, everybody was, you know, even in recruiting, people were saying, hey, why, why do you want to choose A&M? All they have is transfers. No, we don't. Seventy five percent of our games, we've started three freshmen mm -hmm. or more. Right. So so that's that's good from a recruiting standpoint. It's good to build the program long term. Uh, it's just a challenge in this league. Yeah. Uh, and it's a challenge in college baseball these days. I don't care if you're playing Portland or you're playing Florida. Everybody's team is old. Yep. Everybody's team. And so you're playing 22 and 23 year old guys and you're rolling out 18 year olds. Last year, that was our team. Yep. You know, we were really, really old. So, uh, you know, that's what we want. You know, we want to try to build that foundation of, of players like an Austin Bose, Targotch, guys that uh, the guys that I inherit that, uh, that we inherited who were already build into the program they're Aggies they love it here like and that those are the guys you build your program around and then you supplement your program with the transfers that you need we're gonna take a time out with coach talk more about SEC play coming up also want to get your thoughts on the first uh, 17 games of the new rules of college baseball with the pitch clock I've seen that and I know you've been a vocal yeah. uh, a proponent and opponent of some things that have gone on in college baseball I want to get your take on that and we'll preview this weekend series against LSU as the uh, Aggies return to Bluebell Park to take on the number one team in the land on Friday night starting at 6 o'clock more on the Aggie baseball radio hour coming up we'll be right back this is Aggie baseball from Learfield This segment of the Aggie Baseball Hour is brought to you by our friends at 44 Farms. They invite you to enjoy their premium all-natural Angus beef by visiting 44steaks.com today. 44 Farms, the official beef of the Fighting Texas Aggies. Tyler Pick, Jim Sloshnagel with you here for the second episode of the Aggie Baseball Hour here from Rudy's on 504, 504 Harvey Road. Coach, uh, good crowd on hand tonight. I want to see a good crowd uh, Friday night when the LSU Tigers come to town. It's a, it's a pretty daunting slate for you guys to start SEC play. <laughs> I mean, we know how good the league is in general with all 14 teams, but I don't think when you drew it up, you wanted to get number one LSU, go to, on the road to number two Tennessee, number three Ole Miss at home, back to back. We got to talk to some folks at Birmingham as we start this new scheduling model that comes yeah. into play in a couple of years. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I mean, you know, when you when you sign up to be an Aggie and be in this conference, yep. as, especially in college baseball and just like football, um, uh, you know, you, it is what it is, especially in the SEC West. So. You know, part of that is is daunting, but part of it's also super exciting and challenging, and and uh, certainly it's got a chance to make you better. It's certainly going to expose the things you're you're not good at, uh, but it's also a great opportunity. So you sh that, that's why you play the games. Yep. You know, there are it's never about the best team to any team that you, that team that plays the best. So um, you know, it, it, it is what it is, and uh, we're just going to have to keep our head above water and and just keep keep uh, keep. You know, throwing strikes, playing playing good baseball. I mean, and force the other team, you know, hopefully to do the opposite. This league, I mean, top seven teams in the country, or six out of the seven, are from the Southeastern Conference. You guys are eleven in the latest <laughs> T1 baseball. I don't even know that stuff, and then you tell me, and I want to quit. I <laughs> don't say that. We got a lot of baseball left. <laughs> hey, but the, you know, you talked about this a lot last year, your first year in the league, and you had to kind of pick. You guys had to pick up a lot of information on this on everybody in the league that you played all ten series. Now you've got kind of the book. What is your how does your staff go in after you've played 17 non-conference games? Do you go home and watch Ole Miss play Jacksonville State last night? Do you like how do you guys kind of prep? Because everybody plays on a Tuesday night. Everybody's playing on a weekend. And how do you guys over time try to build up your reports while getting ready to play your non-conference series? Yeah, we don't. We, we, we don't pay attention to – I mean, we just look at the – next. I never, ever look at the next team until – like, I don't look at LSU. I started that this morning. Uh, I don't look past Houston. I don't want to even – there's so many things that go – that. 
e each individual member of our coaching staff is assigned to a certain part of the game to evaluate and then we meet uh, the day of the game and everybody whether it be infield positioning outfield positioning how we're going to pitch these guys all this there's so much information that we're processing that if I tried to do that with two different teams they, like it's like a, a, a tournament like Minute yeah. Maid like that's a nightmare because you're you have to prepare for three different teams um and so, so anyway that's a lot of work and it's a lot of and I don't want to mix that information I'd rather just pay attention to Houston get prepared for them like we did yesterday and then we're all in on LSU and because teams change uh, your team changes um you know by the time you know, we get to Ole Miss or Auburn or any of those teams, like a thousand different things can change. And there's more information on those sure. teams, right? So I, I, I took Twitter off my phone. I rarely even look at scores anymore. Uh, I'm just focused on our team and how, how can – most of the video I watch is how can we make Cortez better, how can we make Jace Lavalette better, like and, – and I'll just stay focused on our team and, and – uh, Keep look up at the end of the season and hope we're, you know, in, in the postseason of some sort and be re ready to play that. My wife just smiled back there when you said you took Twitter and not checking scores anymore. She I wishes do. I could do the same thing. So I yeah, don't. yeah, it was hard. I mean, yeah. you know, I took all social media off for uh, a while. Twitter obviously is a big part of recruiting, but but I just uh, I, it's too much. I, yeah. I don't. I, it's just I, I just took it off. I'm going to leave it off for the season. Speaking of what we thought might be too much early on in the year, this whole pace to play pitch clock hitters in the box when the clock starts kind of give us your evaluation of the first uh what's the month of the season um i haven't noticed anything egregious yet we've seen some maybe different interpretations of a pickoff play at second here or there but right. nothing egregious involving the aggies so far but we have seen some things around the country um that i know that have kind of sparked the eyes of coaches in the college baseball world so what's your thoughts on the first uh, four weeks of this yeah i mean in general I mean, I voted for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want, and I, I, I'm okay with speeding up the pace of play. I think that appeals to the novice fan. Um, you know, it, it's fine. The problem is we in, put it in into the game before the facilities were ready for them. Yep. So, in other words, we played a game last night. Think about, um, we got a basketball game on right now. They have a clock that you can see. Imagine playing a sh basketball game with a shot clock that you can't see. Yep. So I mean, what I don't understand. I mean, that that's that's completely foolish to me. So last night, there's no clock on the field at University of Houston. The third base umpire who has to pay attention to check swings and has to pay attention to fair and foul. He's got a watch in his hand. He and then he calls strike three on Jace. Well, Jace and Jace went by on his way out to the field. Said, what, what did I do? And he said, well, you were in the box at 11 seconds, but you weren't looking at the pitcher. To me, there's a thing called preventative umpiring yeah. where you have the opportunity to just, okay, he's in there, he's ready, just have some feel for the game. When the clock is out there for everybody to see, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Once it gets to nine seconds, strike. Yeah, fair you game. You know, it, fair game, no problem. But even at Texas A&M, we're supposed to have, you know, we have – you know, one of the most highest grossing revenue athletic departments in the country. We don't have the clocks behind home plate. Yep. Like we've ordered them, but they're all back ordered. So a pitcher at an A&M game, the clock's behind him. The clock's supposed to be out in front of him. And so there should be one for the hitter and there should be at least one for the pitcher. And so uh, ours was supposed to be in before the first game, but it's not back yet. It's not in here yet. So I, I'm okay with the rule. It's just that we weren't ready. Everybody rushed to the impl implementation of the rule. And if a place like Texas A&M go isn't going to have a clock, imagine Western Michigan or, you know, I mean, Rice, Rice didn't have a clock, didn't have instant replay. Like, I mean, I don't know. That, that, it's just it, it, I think we rushed to that. And it's not fair on the umpires yeah. the most. It's not fair for them because they're being evaluated. And if there's some umpire evaluator up in the stands and these guys want to make the postseason, you know, they, they want to be in a regional. They want to be in the College World Series. And if they're not doing the right thing, then they get penalized. So I can't fault them. Um, so I, overall, I, I think most fans like it. It's moving. There's no question it's moving quicker. I think the technology has as much to do with it, us getting the signs on the wristband, as it does the clock itself. Um, but 
it, there's just been some growing pains, but I mean, think, things are getting better. Uh, and we'll see, we have three more clocks yep. per se in SEC play that start to Friday night. There's a between batter clock of 30 seconds. There's a mound visit clock of 30 seconds. And a new pitcher has two minutes and 30 seconds to get loose once the time he comes out of the bullpen. So if you're a clock maker, isn't there, what's the name of a clock maker? Isn't there a... Is yeah, there is a name, Coach, and I'm trying to remember what it's called. If you, if you work for Dactronics right now, which is the company that provides all this, you're yeah. really in business right now. They already are in business, but the, the revenue generation like is Like if you make shoes, you, you, co- you cobble it. That's yeah, if you're a cobbler. You're a cobbler. Yep. Yeah, so a watchmaker can make, I mean, like a, a clockmaker can make a lot of money these days because there's a lot, there's a lot of, of clocks in well, baseball. And that's what I was going to ask you, too. It's this, it's becoming this umpire discretion thing, which is the whole point of taking it the, with the clocks, right. but it's really setting up the haves and the have-nots. And even at Texas A&M, while... The only person that can see it is the pitcher or the catcher and the hitter. It sets the other eight guys on the field a little right. bit of a disadvantage, too, because you guys have used the wristband communication to help your infielders out when it comes to pitches coming in. Um, it's sped up getting the signs in. It's, I think Nate, Nate Yeski is getting his heart rate up because he has a sprint sure. to the mound back and forth. It's, it's made you guys think about how to be really intentional. I know you guys Ooh. worked a lot of that during the uh, offseason, for sure, during the fall and spring, early parts, to just get used to the rules because they're different from how the pace of play has happened. Yeah, I, I feel like we are as prepared, and you can ask the players, Jack and uh, Hunter in a little bit. I think we were we were as prepared or more prepared than any team in the country for these rules, and we still had a lot of adjustment yep. to make. Uh, but the but the the wristband thing has has helped a lot. Last thing before we go the, to break, I want to ask you about this uh, and the. Uh, Portland series, you guys broke out the uh, core of Cadets jerseys, a big project that you and Jason Hutchins worked on for 18 months. Fans loved it. The 12th man was really excited. They purchased a ton online. But can you walk the fans through the process of that whole, uh, you know, how that came about, the tying with the core? You guys have visited with them multiple times. And, and that game, I think we had over 2,000 core members there. They wore, I think we're 3-0 and in them, by the way. So keep rolling, uh, doing a good job there. Not superstitious or anything. No, but Routine. Uh, routine. Uh, but it's uh, it's been a, re- a really big hit and a really cool uh, a thing that you guys have put into place over the last year with this group yeah i mean you know just when myself and our coaching staff came to a&m we you know you want to when you're in, when, when you're on the outside looking in you you wonder what what does that tradition mean what does the core mean what is the 12th man what what exactly are all those things and then you, you know you come here and they hand me a three ring binder and it explains everything and and then you you know i, I try to dive in i went to bonfire i went to yell practice i went to everything i've gone to everything i could possibly fit in and uh the core was just so impressive and so uh i don't know it humbles you you know like you make sure you 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 feel like you're a part of something that's just way bigger than yep. any one person and so uh I talked with Hutch about it, who's been here for 25 years, and I said, man, it'd be really cool if we did a neat uniform that modeled the core. And so we met with, uh, first I met with um, the former commandant, who's now the uh, Dean of Student Affairs, um, and uh, he, he, he thought it was a great idea. He connected me with the leadership of the core. We sat down and asked them, how do you feel about this? We don't want to do anything to upset anyone, or w- if we do it, we want to do it right. So they helped us design the uniform, and then, uh, you know, we continued to tweak it, and uh, and then Adidas did a nice job with it, and I, I think I th- the fans have really enjoyed it. Yeah, you guys represent every core unit on your sleeve. 40, uh, yeah, 41 or 42 different units, yeah, on course, the sleeve. Core values in the back, they're really, really, really well done. You can get those on 12thmanshop.com if you want to wear them to Sunday's game. Cross your fingers. The Aggies can keep rolling in them, but they've won for sure. So Coach and I are going to step aside. We're going to come back. We're going to preview this LSU series as the number one Tigers come to Bluebell Park this weekend. I want to remind you, if you're planning ahead of the ballpark, limited GA ticket inventory may be available this weekend for section. 12 otherwise it's a sellout this weekend at Olsen Field be on the lookout on our Aggie baseball social channels and see if there's some inventory hopefully on Friday Saturday or Sunday if LSU returns some tickets to us but we'll see you at Bluebell Park this weekend no matter what coach and I are going to talk all things Texas A&M and LSU when we return here on the Aggie baseball hour this is Aggie baseball from Learfield Back with a packed house here at Rudy's Barbecue here on 504 Harvey Road. Baseball and barbecue lovers know the perfect brisket needs the right wood. And Rudy smokes all their meats using their delicious signature rubs and 100% oak fire pits. Get your real Texas barbecue today at Rudy's or online at Rudy's.com. Jim Slosh, Nagel, Tyler Pig here with you on the third or second episode of the Aggie Baseball Hour. We're going to be joined by the Aggie shortstop Hunter Haas and first baseman Jack Moss in a moment. Coach, 
Let's talk a couple things. We've got a sellout crowd coming this weekend as number one LSU comes to town. Give us a little bit of a facility update if you can, because I know you've talked about that a lot of your time here. There's some modifications that are in the works for Bluebell Park. It would be great to have 10,000 Aggies there this weekend to block out a lot of purple and gold that's probably coming down I-10 from Baton Rouge. So where do you think stand right now as you start an SEC play and maybe as we get to the summer here at the ballpark? Yeah, I mean, I'd, ideally, I'd like to have twelve to 15,000 seats. I think you know, <laughs> Texas A&M being the largest school and – we have five, over 540,000 former students and 29 million people who live within three hours of Bryan College Station. I think, you know, we should have a, uh, you know, a, a ballpark that can accommodate all that. But, uh, you know, we're, we have our next, uh, you know, that, the, 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 pr the process for renovation or new ballpark, whatever you want to call it, uh, has begun. The Board of Regents approved the project um, in the fall, and uh, now we're just going through all the steps you can imagine, as you know, yeah. uh, the red tape and the steps that go through, especially at a state university. Uh, so we're going through those. Um, the next, we have a meeting here in the next couple of weeks, which I know you're a part of, yeah. and we'll begin with the. I think we have chosen an architect and designer, and we'll begin to really try to pare down. You know what? What is? Uh, we'll start with a blank canvas. Hey, in a perfect world, these are the things we'd like to see, which, in general, for the fans, is additional seating get rid of the berms, more chair back seating, seating uh, 360 degree uh, all the way around the stadium concourse, uh, seats in, the, in left field, seats in right field, um, you know, the ability to sit behind home plate and, hey, I want to go visit my buddy out there in left field, the ability to do that. Um, obviously, if we stay on the same exact footprint, um, then we're landlocked a little bit by the, by the uh, rec center and the railroad tracks. The university has been great to work with to this point. They're going to give us part of the parking lot to do some things uh, for the players. Um, we can go up as much as we want, yep. uh, for example, in left field, uh, but we can only go back. That, that, uh, that fire lane is going to have to stay so we can go all the way to that curb. We could bring left field in a little bit, which we may, but we can go up as much as we want. So you may see as many as two decks of seats yep. in left field, the video board above that, kind of center field, would be your, you know, concessions, bathrooms, all the support areas needed for the seats out there. And then in right field, um, all kinds of options. Could be some terraced berm seating, could be bleacher seating, could be chair back seating, could be a combination of all those things. Um, and then the chair backs all the way around. And then we'll obviously add some, you know, uh, clubs and different things that people want these days. Suites, potentially more. I think there's more demand uh, for private, you know, some, kind of some private seating as well. But we also, you know, we, we want those longtime fans that have had their seats for 25, 30, 30, you know, whatever it is plus years. We want to make sure we, we don't lose them as well. We don't want to lose anybody. We want to make sure they can get a great seat and there will be more of them so we can pack as many Aggies in that ballpark as possible. Well, the crowd has been phenomenal over the first three weekends really here. It's going to be phenomenal this weekend, like we said. And it, it all starts with number one LSU this weekend for <laughs> SEC play. You know, I thought about it on the ride down to Houston last night doing the game is last year, Houston comes up here, you guys lose 8-2, to two, and then go play LSU. And things from that point on really clicked. But it was a different look team in that LSU series from what playing Omaha three yep. months later. Uh, it all starts really with LSU to me on the mound with Paul Skeens. I mean, he is an electric arm. You talked about it. He's 99 to 101. He is the elite of the Friday night guy. But their offense, obviously, they've got a ton of power and a ton of returners at Jay Johnson's ball club. So kind of what's your initial scouting reports on those guys as you, as you dive into your LSU prep? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, they're the number one team in the country. They were preseason, and they've played like it every day since. They're, they're pitching, you know, they're hitting over 340, 350 as a team. Uh, they're pitching under three ERA, and they're actually, they've only made five errors from the whole season. Yeah. Um, last year, they didn't, they weren't a great, they were, we were the next to last defensive team in, in the league, and they were the last. Yep. So they're catching the baseball better. They, they took a lot of transfers. Um, Paul Skeens, the Friday night starter, being one of them from the Air Force Academy, uh, super talented player, could very well be the first pick of the entire draft. Yeah. Um, they could have the first college pitcher selected in the draft and the first college position player yeah. selected in the draft in their center fielder, uh, Dylan Cruz. So super talented team, uh, but pretty sure they put their pants on just like we do. Yep. Uh, they, I think they all have two legs. They all have two arms. Uh, and so, you know, we just have to go play and play good baseball. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's coachy, it's, but it's, the best team doesn't win. It's the team that plays the best. And there's, our players know they hear from me all the time. There's times when 
especially in the first four weeks of this season, where if you look at the Major League Draft and you, you look at each team's players, we've had better players than the other team, but the other team has won the game, right? Yep. And so there's also going to be times where the other team, per the draft or scouts or whatever, or rankings say that the other team has better players than we have, but we have to play better. So last year, you know, that was, the, that was one of our kind of uh, calling cards was – it's not, about, it's not about each individual part. It's about the sum of the parts. How can you play for each other? How can you play together uh, and then win a ball game? Yep. And so, um, you know, we're, you, you see that in bat college basketball all the time. So in college baseball, obviously the pitcher dominates what goes on. Um, but he's just as likely to have a bad day as, as anybody else. And, and you know, this is, he's obviously crazy talented. It's going to be cold. Uh, you know, 100, 100 miles an hour when it's cold, is that's tough. Uh, but we're going to make him throw it over the plate, and then we'll just see what happens. You mentioned March Madness before I let you get out of here. Who's your pick? Uh, Aggies, for like, sure. That was, a, that was a fastball <laughs> in the 90 right down the middle. Yeah, 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 I, uh, yeah I, I'll try to be watching as much as I can, and I'm a big college basketball fan, as you know. So oh, yeah. I'm going to sneak out of here and have dinner with my daughter and before this weekend gets going. Yeah, catch a cut. You got a first four game. Don't let her forget. You got to catch the, I think it's Nevada, Arizona State. I'm sure you just need to, just tell her you need to peek away because I know you're a big hoops yeah, guy too. Yeah, so yeah we'll that, be doing that. That's the head coach of the Fighting Texas Aggies, Jim Slosh. Thank you, Coach. Thanks for your time tonight. We'll see you this weekend at Blue Bell Park. All right. Thank you. All right. Hunter Haas, Jack Moss, join us next here on the episode of the Aggie Baseball Hour right here for Rudy's Barbecue. We'll be right back. This is Aggie Baseball from Learfield. Mas Fajitas is a proud partner of Texas A&M Athletics. Come by and see us at our College Station location off Highway 6 for great food, great drinks, and great service. Mas Fajitas, proud partner of Texas A&M Athletics. Tyler Pick back with you here from Rudy's Barbecue, 504 Harvey Road, joined by the Aggie shortstop Hunter Haas and the first baseman Jack Moss here on the Aggie Baseball Hour. Guys, thanks for joining us tonight. It's been a busy Gosh, 10 days for you guys. I think it's been seven games or eight games over the last 10 days. But thanks for hopping by tonight after a big win over the Cougars last night in Houston. Definitely. Thanks, thanks for having me. Hunter, Jack, I don't know. I think a lot of our fans know this. We've talked about it on our radio broadcast, and I know Jack and I talked about it post game on Sunday. You guys have known each other for a long time. Not only did you play together at Arizona State for a little bit, Michael Early was really key for you guys in, in getting here to Texas A&M, but you guys have played baseball against each other growing up because of how close Colorado and Arizona are. You guys have got a lot of long time going back with each other, a lot of familiarity. Now your teammates here in Aggieland. Hunter, how's it been so far for you as the, the new guy in town who, who transferred in from Arizona State? Off to a really good start. It's, it's been awesome. Awesome. I mean, these guys have treated me uh, like I've been here all along. I was here, they treated me like I was here last year. Uh, it's really been no different for me coming in, and I couldn't ask for a better program and organization to welcome me in and, and be ready to go. So um, it, it, it also really helped knowing Jack and playing with him growing up. Jack, how was it like when Hunter reached out and said, hey, man, I think I'm interested in coming to College Station. Did you immediately call a coach you say hey man you got to get here quick like, we've got a really good team coming back but shortstop was obviously a position this team needed coming into 2023 and, and what was that like to get hunter here yeah i mean obviously kind of like hunter said like we've known each other for a long time and you know, i've always thought really high things about hunter and uh you know i obviously knew him in arizona state and he was my roommate my freshman year so we have a we have a history and you know, obviously the connection with Coach Early yeah. and, you know, Coach Schlossnagel asked me about Hunter and I was like, yeah, absolutely. Like, we need to get this guy 1,000%. Jack, you're the one of the experienced veterans on this ball club and, you know, uh, after the Portland series, we all kind of thought like, man, are we off to the same 2022 start? And then after that, you guys have really, it's been off like a rocket ship, one eight in a row, one ten out of the last 11. What was it like after that Sunday win against Portland where it seems things have really just taken off since then? The bats have come alive. You guys have really had a lot of good starting pitching and good defense and the bullpen's found some really key pay, uh, faces to run out there on the, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday night. Yeah, well, I think it just starts with the culture in our, in our clubhouse. Uh, we have a lot of really good guys who are pulling for one another. Uh, regardless of how much they're playing and uh, you know when you get those things going it's it's it makes it easier to bounce back from adversity or kind of getting hit in the mouth when you experience uh, a loss against Portland which was a pretty good team yeah. and uh, you know I mean you know, when you have that those group of guys coming back like Brett, AB and uh, Trev and everyone else who returned and you got great guys like Hunter who came in and you know there's a bunch of others to name but you know it really helps when, like I said, you experience that adversity early on and you're able to bounce back yeah. a little easier. How have you helped that group of newcomers? There's nine transfers on this team, and you were one a year ago, Jack. Yeah. How have you kind of helped 
bring these guys up to speed with what the culture's like, the system that Coach Slosh Nagel wants to play with on offense, especially with, with Michael Early and Nolan Kane kind of helping uh, move everything along. How did you guys kind of bring group guys in like Hunter Haas or the group of freshmen that have made a really big, big impact for this ball club so far? Yeah, well, I'm not like it's hard to take credit for how good of baseball players they are. <laughs> so, I mean, really our job or my role was just to welcome in everybody like family. And, you know, I know how I was treated when I first got here. And like Hunter said, it was like I was I've been an Aggie my entire life. And, yep. you know, I owe that to all the guys who came back in 2022 from that 2021 Aggie team who welcomed me in. And it was, you know, they treated me like family and you know I really just wanted to do the same for everybody that has come in and uh, you know that that's really the only thing I could do and uh, just welcome everybody in. Hunter through the first 17 games you you've really kind of found your niche in the lineup hitting first or second usually Jack's either right behind you but what have been kind of the keys this year success you've obviously I think where you were leading the SEC in walks through the weekend uh, you've had hit or reached base in 15 to 16 you had your I was supposed to mention this your second career inside the park yeah. home run so two of your five career home runs 40 percent of them don't leave the yard but that's yeah. pretty good uh, what, what's that kind of uh, you've kind of really found your niche in the top of the order for this group offensively and, and kind of been a key cock for this group I think it's been uh just been really committed to what I want to do each and every pitch and hitting that reset button every pitch and not letting previous stuff determine what's going to happen in, in the future. So um, we're really big on breathing here and finding focal points and stuff. And uh, I think that's been huge for me so I can lock in every single pitch and uh, lock into my approach to what I need to do and, and what I'm looking for. So. Can you talk about the guy that's playing second base with you? He seems to get, like, a little bit hotter each night. Like, he's eight. Austin Bose is 19 for his last 38. Yeah. Uh, he's hitting 500 in the last 10 games, driven in 19 runs, had a big RBI triple last night. But uh, Austin struggled early on in the year, and then he's really got it going. But you guys have formed a pretty good pairing up the middle yep. uh, defensively. So talk about that combination. Offensively, where you guys in the top of the order, and then defensively, what you guys have done up the middle for this team. Yeah, that's one of my, my good buddies on the team. So uh, I think we're both really competitive and we really push each other. Uh, so it's really fun to play up the middle with him. Um, but he's a great hitter. Um, I pick his brain a lot just being younger than he is. Yep. Um, but he, he knows what he wants to do up there, and, and he's really fun to watch. And so I think everyone everyone knew what, what he was capable of, and no one really doubted him at the beginning of the year or anything like that. Everyone had faith and everybody to get going so jack i wanted to get your thoughts on hunter two with this you know we coach talked about it earlier when we were on the show you know you lose uh brad minnick in the first first his first ab of the year gets banged up trevor warner's been out the last 10 days or so day to day but you guys have had some really key freshmen step in and make some really big impacts i mean we could go down the list case and wells has been solid on the outfield uh, tab tracy's a transfer but tab's fitting really well out there Caden kent's been solid jason laviolette's hit a couple of really big time home runs uh, a couple times at blue Bell park this year what have you seen out of that freshman group, especially position players? You obviously said that they were highly recruited, highly touted, but what have they done really to fit in really well? And what have they done to get better from February 17th to now? Yeah, I mean, like you said, they were obviously, you know, highly touted coming out of high school. Um, but, you know, I was kind of, I told someone earlier, man, I, I, I don't, like, it took me a while to find my stride uh, mm -hmm. in college. Uh, you know, my first month and a half, two months, I was in and out of the lineup and, struggling and you know the line the at bats I did have it was like I needed to get a hit every single time just to stay in the lineup and just to contribute but you know those guys it's awesome because they don't really seem to care about that they just kind of go out and just compete and do whatever they can that day to help the team win and that's really cool um, and it's our job as older guys just to help them as best we can with the mental side and just the grind that a college baseball season can bring and just to remind them that you're probably not going to hit 500 with 20 home runs like yep. you did in high school. Uh, it's obviously a really tough game, and, um, you know, you're going to learn a lot over the course of the season, and yeah, just be supportive. Uh, Hunter, I was going to ask you this because you played a lot next to Caden Ken recently with Caden coming into third. He's played a ton of games in left field, but has now has kind of found a spot at third base with Trevor being out for a little bit. And um, I'm not sure if I've ever seen a more serious and intense freshman in college baseball yeah uh, I don't, you guys are probably a little too young these guys out here remember jeff kent his dad was an mvp uh, if you remember jeff kent playing he was serious at all times whether he was the astros the dodgers uh the reds the mets uh the giants he's just a left-handed version of his dad because he's a professional at the plate i mean it's but what do you see out of caden because he's versatile he's a shortstop by trade but he's fit in everywhere and kind of every spot in the order and then especially defensively for you guys yeah since day one uh since since he got here you know he's had one thing on his mind and i was getting in the lineup yep and you can see it and 
as an older guy, you know, you really respect that because he, I know he even pushed me and he pushed a bunch of the infielders to, to raise our game. Uh, he's an ultra competitive and, you know, he works his butt off nonstop. Uh, so he's, he's really fun to, to come to the field and work with a guy like that who's a young guy, but, you know, he's always, he's always coming for somebody's job. He's always going to work hard. And, you know, those are the guys that's coming, coming up behind you. So it, uh, it's really refreshing to see and where this program's headed to have that kind of culture. Got more with Jack and Hunter coming up. We're going to talk a little SEC baseball coming up. First, when we get back, I want to get your thoughts on playing at Bluebell Park for the first time. And, Jack, how good the crowds have been so far, the 12th man showing up so far in the first four weekends here at Old Sinfield. We're going to take a timeout, step aside here in the Aggie Baseball Hour. More with Jack and Hunter when we return. This is Aggie Baseball from Learfield. Hey, 12th man, there's really no better way to describe the uniqueness of Walk-On Sports Bistro. We start every dish from scratch and use fresh ingredients to bring our mouth-watering Cajun cuisine to life. And whether you're here for dinner or with the family, day, night, cocktails with the girls, or to watch a game on the big screen, we're always happy to share our Louisiana culture with you. Walk-On's proud partner of Texas A&M Athletics. Final segment here on the Aggie Baseball Hour, Episode 2. We've got a, three more episodes to come, one in April, one in May, and hopefully another one in June as the Aggies will get set for postseason play down the line. But first up, guys, this weekend, it's number one LSU. Speaking of some Louisiana culture, it's going to be a lot of purple and gold. I know trying to come down from Baton Rouge. And, Jack, for you, this ball club went to LSU a year ago to open SEC play. And, and that was, we looking back on it, really a pivotal series because this team really was trying to find what it was really going to be about in 2022. What, what are your kind of memories of going to the box last year and winning that series? And, and, and really could almost have been a sweep, but it was just a really, really tough three baseball games. You guys took two out of three of those from those guys. Yeah, uh, well, that was the Pringle. That was the first game we bust out the Pringles. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was just. I think the first, however long, we were just kind of, I pressing a little bit and putting a little too much pressure on ourselves, and we really shouldn't have. We knew that we had a really good team in the fall and preseason, and I had a year of college baseball under my, experience under my belt at the time, and we all knew that we had a good team. It was just a matter of just finding it at the right time, and that was a weekend that, or I guess really the first weekend where we proved that we, we knew what we were. What was the turning point in that whole series you thought? I mean, I know the Pringles were a big part, but it seemed like yeah. it might have been Micah Dallas' start that really got it going, and then some clutch hits down the line there that's in that, uh, during that series that just seemed to come at the right time. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I felt like there was just a lot of things that whole weekend. I think that we, we fell down early in the first game, and then we had – back-to-back -back home runs from D-Rock and Tar. Yep. And that was like the first weekend where D-Rock really uh, put it together. And then from there on out, it w he was obviously incredible. Out, yeah. yeah, and unbelievable. Um, and, you know, just obviously really big pitching performances late in those ball games, like big bullpen um, out appearances. And, uh, yeah, and then we just – the other part of it too, I think, was just being on the road for the first time in a different state and just, I don't know, bonding. And I, you can learn a lot about yourselves and a team and creating that family uh, atmosphere, just being on the road, kind of the us against the world mentality. Hunter, what have you enjoyed so much about the first three weekends at home and then playing in front of a ton of Aggies two weekends ago in Houston at Minute Maid Park? But, I mean, the last the first four weekends of the season, it's been packed at Bluebell Park. What's your, your experience about coming in from the Pac-12, getting to play on Olsenville for the first time and seeing a ton of maroon and white in the stands really from the front first Friday all the way through so yeah. far? The fan base has been awesome. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why you come to Aggieland is to play in front of these fans. Uh, you know, that's what, what you dream about when you're a kid is playing in front of a packed house, uh, playing with ball in the backyard with my brother. Uh, you talk about those situations. So it's really cool to, to be in the moment, and, and you really just don't take it for granted. You know, before every game I, like, I look around, and it's just awesome to see uh, so much maroon and white. You guys got to experience, I think, every Aggie baseball tradition uh, in the walk-off win against Portland three weeks ago. The Corps of Cadets uh, uniforms debut. There's a ton of ball five chance in that, in that Saturday or Sunday game as well. You have bubbles flying everywhere. Jay Slagolette hits the RBI double to win it. That, what was that kind of first Sunday walk-off win like that to get some Olsen magic? Did you really, were you really expecting to see it that early, or were you just really cool to, glad to get a game and, and see it under your belt? I think it was just really, really cool to see. It was a really cool game to be a part of. But, um, like, once once we're out there and once we're playing, it's just it's just the same game yep. we've played our entire life. Uh, so it, once 
once that happens and the crowd goes crazy, it obviously gives you some extra energy. So it's really cool to, to be out there. Jack, Coach was talking about it earlier with LSU. They, they bring a ton of talent. And obviously on the mound, Paul Skeens is their Friday night guy. He's elite. But your pitching staff has been pretty solid when you guys have played, by, played behind those guys. Nathan Detmer, Troy Wansing, Chris Cortez, Justin Lampkins coach so far in his two midweek starts. What have you seen out of that group? Because uh, Coach and I talked about it earlier, starting pitching was not really this team's strength in mid-March in 2022. Besides maybe two starts, other than that, the starters have really worked deep and been able to really make quick work of a lot of guys so far in the season. Yeah, no, we have one of the best bullpens and uh, rotations in the country, in my opinion. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, like you said, I know it's, it's going to be tough for us. We're going to have our work cut out for us this weekend against that rotation. But, I mean, I, th I think we've, we've heard, you know, from pretty much everybody how good LSU is. And, uh, you know, the chip on our shoulder is definitely there. And, you know, I mean, we're going to go out and, you know, give them our best. And I'm sure they're going to give us the same. But, you know, I got Nathan Detmer, Troy Wansing, and Chris Cortez over anybody in the country. Well, guys, thank you for joining us tonight. We'll see you Friday night at Bluebell Park. First pitch, 6.02. We'll be ready to go. Awesome. awesome. That's Jack Moss, Hunter Haas. Thank you guys for coming tonight to the Aggie Baseball Hour. This copyrighted broadcast it is an exclusive presentation of Learfield under the broadcasting rights granted by Texas A&M University. Reuse of this presentation is prohibited without the express written consent of Texas A&M University and Learfield. And announcers are provided by Learfield and Texas A&M University. Will Johnson's got the call with you right here on the Texas A&M Sports Network Friday night from Bluebell Park. 5.45 p.m. is the pregame show. 6 o'clock first pitch. I'll have the call with you Saturday and Sunday as the Aggies get set to face number one LSU. Thanks for joining us tonight on the Aggie Baseball Hour. We'll see you this week in the Blue Bell Park. This is Aggie Baseball from Learfield.